Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Tech Edge 2020. Uh, my name is Dustin Slafley, and I am hosting your marketing chat room this morning, live here from my um, office back at Next Tech. If you read my little bio on the introductory, uh, talked a little bit about my Basset Hound and kind of spending some time with her. So during the, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, many of us here at Next Tech worked from home, and I came back to work about two weeks ago. but. Um, it was actually a cool experience uh, getting to be at home a little bit. I think she misses me being at home, uh, but the whole experience, um, I think, really taught us a lot and really taught us a lot about technology and how we can adapt to technology and really adapting to this virtual conference is part of really utilizing that technology. So with me today um, in the marketing chat room is uh, Daniel Schwint. Um, he actually works remotely for us as well, too. He's in McPherson. Uh, so say good morning, Daniel, and if you'd like to introduce yourself and kind of tell them what you do here at Next Tech. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I am a digital marketing specialist here at Next Tech, which means that I kind of cover the whole gamut of uh, digital marketing services from building websites, primarily uh, the platform that we work with is WordPress. So I spend a lot of time in WordPress building websites. Uh, I run Google ads. Um, search video display, um, optimizing Facebook posts, and just working in SEO and general analytics. All right, thanks, Daniel. Uh, so kind of how we're gonna run this this morning, Daniel and I really don't have a lot of um, scheduled content to really present. Um, this is really about your guys' opportunity to really ask us questions. Um, if you have you know, questions about your business, um, how you should market something, we can give you as much suggestion and feedback as possible. Uh, I do have a few canned questions kind of put together um, to kind of uh, probe Daniel a little bit to talk about a few things that we're uh, doing here at Next Tech. But I really want to give the opportunity to you guys out there. This is your uh, opportunity to ask us questions. So over in the chat panel, I see many of you that are on here this morning have found the chat panel. Um, and if you haven't noticed, I know there's been a couple other uh, chats and replies earlier this morning about not being able to hear audio. When the webinar actually starts in each different session, there's a there should be a button in the middle of your screen that you hit uh, display audio or show audio. Hit that, and that should allow you uh, to start hearing the audio and be able to hear it. So uh, what I would like you to do is if you guys just have general questions, uh, put them over in the chat session um, and we will reply to them. And uh, as they come in, I will try to um, read the question so people know what question we're, we're re actually replying to. There is a little bit of delay by the time you put the actual question in and our audio. Um, so I just want to make sure that by me repeating the question, you guys understand what question Daniel and I are actually replying to. So um, if anybody wants to get started and throw a question out there to us, uh, I'm sure throughout the morning, uh, throughout this hour session, we'll probably have people um, jumping maybe in and out, new presenters here and there. Uh, but we will actually, uh, we might start some of the questions over, repeat some of the questions, or I might introduce ourselves again as we get new people back in the session. So um, somebody start us off by throwing out a question for Daniel or I. Well, I will actually kick it off. Um, if nobody has a question to start with, I'm gonna kick it off by just talking a little bit about, uh, and I don't wanna get overburdened on the whole coronavirus pandemic issue that's been going on. Um, but one of the things we hear a lot with when we deal with clients is specifically, you know, surveying customers, how often to survey them, should I survey them? And I always recommend that really in any industry that you should be surveying your customers at least once a year, if not every couple years. Um, I think it's just a good tool to really gauge their satisfaction and basically how you're doing, especially in the service provider industry. If you are a company that provides services, whether it be telecom or banking or whatever it could be, uh, really finding out how you're doing, how your frontline staff is doing. Uh, while we as managers always try to coach and teach all of our team the exact way to reply to a customer, are they actually doing it and fulfilling on it? So actually hearing that uh, firsthand feedback from a customer is actually uh, very good data in my opinion. One of the really interesting things that we've seen here at Next Tech, uh, we do actually quite a bit of surveying, surveying, excuse me. Uh, we actually survey customers on an annual basis that they get an annual survey. 
Um, it's an electronic uh, email survey that they reply to. Um, but we also do a net promoter score survey as well, too. And what's been really interesting over this last probably about three months, kind of when the pandemic and the stay at home uh, really started uh, in our industry, uh, with Next Tech being an essential uh, provider, really having to stay abreast and really still um, help customers and provide te uh, telecommunication services, phone and internet um, and technology to our customers. Uh, we pretty much uh, were fully operational the entire time. We had to take, you know, a, a few uh, specific measures, um, have our staff wear PPE, especially when they're going into homes and businesses. And we our retail stores were closed for a while. But one of the really amazing things that I saw throughout that entire time is that our scores actually went up by almost 6% throughout that time. And then the other kind of amazing uh, stat that I, uh, in our annual surveys that we send out, one of the things that I noticed too is an uptick. Um, typically, a lot of customers will say that price is a driving factor uh, when selecting uh, a telecommunications provider. Um, but that sh there was actually a shift um, that happened um, during the last three months where really customer service um, was is now the uh, the outstanding factor there above price, which I thought was really interesting to see. And I think it goes to show, you know, I think people are very uh, resilient, but they're happy um, that things that we're continuing to provide service. And I think that shows a little bit of the demeanor of customers as a well as as a whole that they are uh, really do value customer service, especially in crisis type situations. So I wanted to share those numbers with you. I thought they were um, good. Uh, there's a few questions starting to trickle in a little bit, uh, so I will see. Daniel, I'm going to turn this one over to you and let you talk about it a little bit since this is really your area of expertise. But this question comes from Bill and it says, what is the hottest platform to advertise in? Google, Facebook, and then kind of questions. So if you have other recommendations besides that, I guess chime in and give your uh, feedback uh, to the uh, listeners out there. Yeah, sure. And and we do a lot of Google and Facebook. I mean, those are those are the two 800 pound gorillas for us. But um, as far as which one is the hottest, to some extent, that that does depend on your type of business. Um, for example, we have uh, some real estate clients and right now, Facebook is performing extremely well for them. Um, some of that is due to the competitive nature of, of that vertical on Google to where it's really just not cost effective to run Google search campaigns that can be very expensive and your results are just very watered down. Whereas Facebook uh, with its unique targeting abilities uh, has just proven extremely effective for generating um, real estate interest in, and particularly mortgage broker leads. Um, but, you know, with that said, that was also uh, something of a unique case. Um, with telco clients, on the other hand, uh, we have found Google to be a little bit more, um, we, we, we use Google a lot more in terms of the variety of campaigns uh, just because Google offers search. So, you know, competing for search terms in search results, getting people who are actively looking for high speed internet. Um, and then you've got video and display. So if you have existing video collateral, again, uh, Google allows you to advertise on YouTube. And then there's the display campaigns. So, um, and again, that can be a little, that can require a little bit more of a budget, but um, Google allows you to cover a lot of ground and has a very extensive network. Hey Daniel, I'm going to uh, chime in just a second. Did you by chance see Bill's reply on uh, the question that you're kind of referring to? But he's wondering if there is, I guess, some other platform that you feel at this point that is kind of becoming the, the hot social media platform at this point? Mm -hmm. I, I would say that those are still far and away the big ones. So they, they're, they're not being threatened by anything else really approaching them or, you know, something that you consider before those. Um, we do 
you know, there's Instagram that uh, there's a lot of active users on Instagram, but for example, Facebook owns Instagram and the campaign that you put on Facebook paid campaigns will almost by default spread over into Instagram. So, so in a way uh, you are covering both of those bases. Agreed. I'll give a personal example, I guess, uh, of a local business here in Hayes. Um, and they're actually, are, I'm not sure that they're reopening after uh, the COVID incident, but it was, it's actually a cupcake store here in Hayes. And I'll give you a perfect instance of how my wife, who is actually not so much of a Facebook user, but she's actually more of an Instagram user, um, but she actually um, follows their page and we absolutely love their cupcakes. And on a daily basis, they do a special cupcake every day and they just do a little Instagram post and put the cupcake of the day out of there. And I will tell you that's probably sold more cupcakes to me and my family um, than really anything because, you know, I think it has to do with sometimes the platform and the use um, and individual use. But I think uh, Instagram is a great resource out there. Um, again, uh, for just some quick um, video usage or some quick snapshot usage to put out there. Uh, Cause I think uh, it's very, it's just a good tool. And I think there's, I think in my opinion and not to go back on what Daniel said, but I would say probably it, out of Google and Facebook, I would say probably third on my list would probably be Instagram. And, and more to what Dustin was describing, um, you know, posting, a cupcake each day or something like that once per week the big difference is that that is free on facebook so all it takes is the the time required to take the photos and post and that can be extremely effective and you have no outside ad spend which is you know not the case on google with any of their campaigns uh, only the the basic google indexing is free mm -hmm. You want to touch on Snapchat a little bit, Daniel? We do a lot in Snapchat. We do the, we primarily by placing filters, um, but um, I don't do any of the Snapchat mm -hmm. and um, I'm, I'm not particularly familiar with that one. I will tell you uh, the one thing that we have uh, that's been somewhat successful for us with a few clients uh, in the Snapchat world is, and I think Snapchat is becoming uh, more of a platform out there. Um, and I will say, uh, I, I think it started out to be a younger platform. Um, I think it's much like uh, Facebook and other social media, it's now transitioning to be uh, more universal across, you know, multiple demographics. Um, but one of the things that we have seen a little bit of success with, um, specifically an eye doctor that we work with, uh, we actually started this probably three or four years ago, um, but is really combining the use of Snapchat and Facebook together. Um, not that they integrate together, but using uh, the filter aspect of Snapchat. Um, what we do for these campaigns specifically is we put together some uh, filters specifically that work at a specific event or things uh, in that area that uh, they are at. Uh, we actually then ask the cu customer, you know, the end user, the person on Snapchat or Facebook or whatever they're using to actually use the filter, um, post it, um, but then actually take a screenshot of it and actually upload it uh, to their Facebook page. So it's really kind of a nice integration of using the two platforms together um, where you can actually basically kind of integrate, you know, maybe a younger demographic who maybe would be more Snapchat oriented and then bringing that back over and posting on Facebook. And then they do like some giveaways and different things like that uh, throughout that with the Facebook uh, feed on that. So that's been one of the successes that we've actually seen um, with using Snapchat. Um, Heather made a comment about uh, being uh, a rural uh, community and only using Facebook uh, due to the age of the community and that they find that to be pretty budget friendly. And, and I would agree. I think, uh, again, I think as time evolves, um, we've really seen a shift in, in the Facebook demographics as a whole, 
how it started out to be really a, a college student user application years ago when it launched. And now we've seen the de demographic switch a lot to be towards uh, an older, even you know, elderly people now using Facebook and getting on uh, to start connecting with friends and family and grandkids and everything that they do. So um, again, I think in talking of social media as a whole, there's a ton of different platforms out there. Um, if you want to attend uh, Aubrey's session later today, she's going to be uh, talking about a lot of these different platforms and uses. I think she's going to be talking about TikTok a little bit, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that's kind of a, a new one. Um, there's Pinterest. There's just a ton of different things out there going on in the world today. But I still, by far and away, I think we probably still see the most traction um, even here at Next Tech and a lot of the clients that we work with um, really on Facebook because there's so much you can do out there with it. Um, from video campaigns to polls to all kinds of um, different just organic posts as well too but it still gets a lot of interaction and by far and away has the most use out there in the industry today um i'll go over to one of my other questions uh with daniel uh, since we don't have any other uh, questions from the audience at this point um, wanted to just talk a little bit about, uh, we work with a lot of clients. Daniel uh, is our resident expert uh, on websites. He does a lot of websites. Um, so I guess I wanted him to talk just a little bit about uh, the importance of a website um, and then talk about when you deal with clients who maybe haven't had a website or transitioning an existing website um, into uh, an updated website. What are some of the key things that you look at in working with them and recommendations that you work with uh, on enhancing that website, Daniel? Yeah, so so when we approach uh, an existing website, so you know, there's already a presence out there, maybe a domain, and we're just trying to you know, maximize that, that potential. Uh, the first thing that we'll look at at this, you know, this, this period in the digital world is mobile friendliness. Is the website responsive? Will it show properly on all size displays all the way down to a cell phone? And uh, the reason that we do that primarily is just for user experience. So many people uh, are going to be on their phones, but also because Google has, as you may know, switched over to mobile first indexing, which means originally when folks would have two different versions of their website, a mobile version and a desktop version. Uh, Google, when desktops were predominant, would use the desktop version and then that would form the baseline for your search engine rankings. And now that, that oh, I think it's 93% of Google searches take place on mobile, um, now Google actually uses the mobile version. So in a sense, it's, it's bought out to index your website it uh, crawls it as if it were a cell phone. And so it's going to use that, that smaller mobile version of your site as the baseline and you will be ranked in Google on that basis. So that doesn't always mean that you should assume that all, all of your traffic is mobile. And actually, for example, with telcos, we find that um, it's, it's still about half and half and desktops even predominant still, but um, Nonetheless, in terms of Google, in terms of SEO, you you just have to have a responsive, uh, mobile friendly website. And so that's really uh, one of the first things we look at. Um, another thing is just general design principles um, on a lot of older sites. The font is way too small. There's legibility issues. There's white spacing issues. Things can get jumbled. Um, you know, maybe it's maybe it's running slow because the hosting provider is a little bit outdated, and so we need to consider a new a new host to house the website. And so we'll, we'll take those things into account. And finally, and this this also uh, would apply if there was no website previously, is what platform to use. Um, and this this depends on on you know how much control and how frequently. Uh, the client will be editing the website, um, and so we'll, you know, if there's if there's going to be a lot of edits and something very very visual and easy to edit is is needed, then we can use something like Wix. Um, but uh, for a design that is more open ended, uh, may need some advanced integrations and you know high performance. 
uh, will use WordPress. So I would say the majority of our sites that we are building new sites are WordPress just for that reason. And, and both Wix and WordPress are fairly uh, user friendly. Um, so they're, they are both good options and both offer very good options for responsiveness. But depending on the, on the goals and the client, uh, we may s recommend one or the other. Okay. Anything else you'd like to share related to websites, Daniel? Um, another issue that we that we work with a lot is is just a basic understanding of SEO and. Um, you know, you have a website out there, but uh, you want to drive traffic to it. And, you know, so there's a lot of questions about SEO and how the how the website can best perform in the eyes of Google. So really, of course, number one is, is user experience. But uh, something that we try to keep in mind throughout the entire design and launch process and throughout all of our digital marketing is just, uh, you know, so much of your website's discoverability on Google and so we try to um, keep that in mind and and um, one of the big things is is well there's the technical side where you would want to make sure that Google can understand uh, your website's structure and there's there's a few things that you can build in to help Google interpret your website um, but there's also some things on Google that you would want to cover um, first and foremost, the, the free one is to claim your Google business listing. And while that, that may not seem like directly a, a website issue, uh, when you claim your Google business listing, you actually can specify to Google what type of business you're running and what your URL is. So it's, it's a really good way of actually helping Google understand your site and understand what types of audiences to drive to your website without completely relying on Google's crawlers, Google's bots, and its rank brain to understand your site on its own. Okay. Um, I just want to give a, a quick reminder. Um, and again, I'll give a quick introduction of myself. I'm Dustin Slapple with Next Tech, and this is Daniel uh, with Next Tech at a person. Um, kind of our web and digital uh, specialist online today. Um, we've got a few people uh, added to the conversation and coming into the, the mix. This is kind of a come and go session, so I just wanted to remind everybody. Um, if you do have questions, uh, please put them out there in the chat uh, and we will get to them. And then I have some kind of um, pre-canned questions that I have for Daniel and some some feedback as my, as, as my own as well. Um, there's a question from Aubrey in here about tracking conversations. Um, if you want to look at that one, uh, Daniel, and reply to that one here in a second, I'm going to go back to a question that Darren actually had on basically kind of looking at funnel activities. And he's really uh, talking more about from a technology standpoint, from the IT provider uh, prospect and really looking at sales activity and how many marketing activities before you actually kind of move that prospect down through the funnel. Um, at NextEc, uh, this is actually one of the things that we are actually really just working on uh, a lot right now. Uh, we've actually had, some of you may be familiar with a system called HubSpot, um, but it's basically, um, I'm going to say a form of a CRM tool, um, but we use it a lot uh, for all of our email campaigns. It's integrated with all of our website content so we can do form tracking, um, any kind of like uh, being able to track a customer online. So if we're, if they're out on the website, they fell out a form, um, we can be able to track that content uh, throughout that. Um, so that's really where we're headed um, to kind of answer your question, Darren, on that piece of it. That's where we're actually really headed with that piece of it is really trying to integrate HubSpot more and use that as a tracking mechanism. So when we do a direct mail, if we do a Facebook campaign, if we do an email campaign, um, really getting those hits on those customers and then tr uh, turning those then over to the sales team 
as a follow-up um, to really actually move them down through the sales funnel um, to hopefully end up being, uh, you know, a buying customer. I will tell you, and this is one of the things I was going to touch on also, just from my perspective, from a general overall, overall marketing perspective, um, we get a lot of questions from clients uh, when we start working from them about, uh, you know, ad spend, how much do I spend? Where do I put my money? Uh, a lot of that. And, you know, I will say, in general, um, I will say it's probably by industry and a lot, uh, but the one thing that I will still say uh, overall, um, you hear a lot of things in the news and the media today that print is dead, print is dying. And I do believe in a lot of aspects it is. Uh, we all know that uh, newspapers are slow at going away. Digital is the predominant thing. Uh, but I will still tell you overall, we get a phenomenal response from direct mail pieces, um, not only for ourselves, um, but not only on the different lines of business that we have, whether it be internet uh, or TV, um, we also see it um, on the IT side as well too. Um, perfect example, we actually, we do a lot with, I'm gonna say little targeted campaigns to specific groups of customers um, and kind of took going back to what uh, Darren had talked about a little bit that have shown some interest or um, specifically customers that are, are another type of customer uh, we did a direct mail piece probably about uh, two weeks ago um, to a very targeted small group of business customers trying to uh, transition them to a, flat, a cloud phone uh, solution. It was a phenomenal campaign. It was small. It was less than 100. And, you know, within uh, about a seven-day period, we had two of them converted to true sales um, and another three or four in, in the pipeline for actually prospects for that as well, too. So I think a lot of people discount direct mail. Um, but I think one of the things that's happening from my perspective is um, direct mail has gone down some, so people aren't getting as much as they used to. So I think it still captures the attention for people. Um, so that's one of the things that I, I would throw out um, as a um, just a comment or feedback on that. And then I'll turn it back over to you, Daniel, if you want to go back and kind of answer the question uh, relating to um, the the tracking the conversations and the ad spend for um, Google and social advertising? Yeah, no problem. So Aubrey asked if you could, uh, if you had the ability to track conversions uh, use on, on your digital campaigns and um, on Google. And yes, you do. Uh, if that is configured on, it, it involves some configuration between, let's say you're running Google ad campaigns and you want to know how many lead forms on your website were completed as a result of your Google campaign. So that would, that's what it's meant by tracking conversions. And you can do that with Google campaigns, do it with your social or Facebook campaigns. Um, and what it involves is usually uh, some extra configurations, the installation of some code provided by Facebook or Google on your website in the appropriate places uh, so that when a lead form is completed then uh, your website fires a notification to facebook or google and connects it with the right campaign and that's a really good way of tracking roi because then you can see you know what was my cost per conversion because impressions are good uh, the clicks are good and it's good to see if your campaign is driving a lot of clicks but you may want to know, you know, how many of those clicks are actually interacting with my business in a meaningful way. And that could be a lead form. Uh, that's what I mentioned, but conversions can really describe a whole range of interactions depending on what's important for you. It may be just viewing a white paper on your website and that may constitute a conversion for you or a phone call. And tracking phone calls from ads is a little bit more complicated and sometimes involves the use of a third-party service, but it can be done. And, and again, that's just a really good way of, of understanding the results of your campaigns because, uh, again, you're seeing your clicks, but you're also seeing, you know, how many of those clicks turned into actual leads. Awesome. Any other questions from the audience out there? All right, we're gonna 
uh, jump in uh, to another, and I'm going to turn it back over to Daniel. Uh, one of the things that we have, uh, kind of one of the things that we've looked at here in the last year or so um, is heat mapping on a website. So I'm going to actually let him kind of explain that a little bit, what it is and how we feel it's kind of important uh, for, you know, tracking uh, of experience on a website and looking at making changes to the website. All right, Dustin. Um, yes. I, I'm not sure what happened, but I, I lost you there for just a moment. Okay, so, am I back? Which question that you're, we're on again? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so in general, talking about websites, one of the things I told everybody is that we've looked at over the last year or so is heat mapping and kind of some cool aspects of it and how it kind of works and how we've even used it internally to make some changes and suggest suggestions to our website, basically looking at traffic pattern on our website. Okay, so yes, heat mapping is a really, really neat technology. Um, and again, it's it's been around for a few years, um, but um, you know, it's 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 kind of coming into its own. There's some really good uh, providers out there that help you implement this technology. And what a heat map is. It is a, a sort of a script or a technology that you build into your, into your website and you run it on a particular page um, so that each page would have a heat map and it records all of the sessions on, your, on that page. So let's say it's your homepage and so the heat mapping technology will record everything that happens with the cursor, where the cursor moves on that page, where it clicks, uh, how the visitor scrolled, where they scrolled to before they left, so how much of the page they viewed. And it will take all of that data, all of those metrics, and uh, sample size that you can figure, so maybe 1,000 visits or 2,000 visits, and then we'll use it to compile the heat map. And the heat map resembles what you would see if you were watching the weather forecast uh, something along those lines where it's just uh, uh, it's a picture of your website uh, as displayed on a desktop screen and then overlaid is that you know something like a weather map so um, yellow for regions with moderate cursor presence um, so that if there is a button on the screen that is being clicked by a lot of visitors that area will be red and you can see exactly how many people click there. Um, there is, uh, and, and so where it really comes in handy and allows you to actually optimize your pages is uh, you will see interesting things. You'll almost always be surprised by what it shows. Uh, for example, you might have a really important call to action uh, such as a contact form on the right side of your page and a really you know, bright attention getting photo on the left. And you may look at your heat map and it may show cursor presence all over the image on the left uh, and maybe a lot of clicks on that image. And that actually happens a lot because you, you don't realize that you, the cursor follows your eye. And so if the eye moves around your call to action, so will the cursor. And it just helps you understand that uh, maybe you need to shift visual focus to your actual call to action. And and some of those things may seem in, in, uh, uh, less important, um, less impactful, but actually it, it really does make a huge difference the more you can streamline the user's experience and just where their eyes are drawn. Um, it can also, you know, something that we've found on a couple of our pages is maybe they were a bit too tall and, um, you know, if we've got a lot of valuable content on the page, we have to tra take great care as to, you know, determining what is the most important content to the visitor. Um, if you're getting 10% of clicks on your first three sections and then 50 or 60 or 70% of the clicks are on a section that is 80% of the way down the page, you need to move that content up. And uh, that's just the kind of thing that you see based on heat mapping. And it's just, it's very nice because it's so visual and so easy to interpret instead of looking at tables of data. Awesome. Thank you. 
Uh, a couple questions I want to reply to that have kind of come in as you were talking. Um, and let me address a couple of these first and then I'll drop uh, back on down. But um, there was a lot of conversation going back and forth about direct mail pieces. And there was a couple of replies. The, the original question was um, lists for direct mail pieces. So, um, you know, a couple different options actually. Bill out here, I think, replied and maybe put uh, stamps.com as an option. Um, Info USA is actually one we've used for years. Um, and uh, just a couple different options, you know, when, cl when clients work with us, uh, we actually subscribe to a large mailing database system so we can actually get small targeted lists for you. Um, that way you're not having to buy or overbuy lists, uh, but we can actually do that and incorporate into the mailing pieces. Um, actually, some of the printers out there as well, um, if you're working on a direct mail piece and we work with a couple of them here in the area, but um, they can actually scrub and get lists for you as well, too. So just a couple options for you out there uh, to look into. Uh, but again, when you're looking at those lists, um, again, you can get by industry, you can get by specific zip code town, uh, a lot of different areas out there. So that was one of the questions that came in. One of the other questions was, does, does Next Tech do web design? Um, and yes, we do. Um, Daniel is actually uh, one of the things he talked about early, earlier on here in the chat room uh, was a little bit about kind of the web design that we do, um, kind of the different couple different platforms uh, that we specifically offer. Um, most of our um, design anymore is done in uh, WordPress, but some of it is actually uh, done in Wix. But yes, we do that for customers. Um, kind of a, a whole process. Um, going through the the onboarding, getting a customer up to speed. Um, we not only do brand new websites, but we can work with you as far as rebuilding or SEO optimization, um, a lot of different things uh, dealing with website design. Um, scroll on through here. Okay, Daniel, I'm gonna read this question out to you and then let you tackle it if you can. Um, it's coming from Brittany. Um, she has two questions here, but I'm going to read the first one um, so everybody knows what we're actually replying to. It says, I've been hearing more recommendations to use link shorteners in order to better track engagement. What are your thoughts on directing an audience on social media to another page, article, website, YouTube video, etc.? I'll let you answer that one first and then I'll come back to the second one. So as far as link shorteners, yes, we, we use that. Um, some some platforms will automatically shorten the link so, uh, social media platforms when you paste the link in um, and so some of that happens in some places automatically but um, we'll also use those on you know graphics or, or marketing pieces for for that specific reason um, no one wants to type you know https colon slash slash and then a bunch of slashes trailing all the way out to get to your page and and something that I believe Megan mentioned in the chat also is just that it's really important to use landing pages, but the more landing pages you have, the more you don't want them just going to your homepage. So your domain name might be short, but depending on you know how many landing pages you accumulate and how complex your URL, URL structure is, that's not something you want to be printing on a lot of collateral. And so uh, uh, to answer the question, yeah, you link shorteners are great. Um, Bitly is one. Google has one. Um, there's a, and again, some social media platforms sort of do it automatically on the fly for you. But um, as far as thoughts on directing an audience on social media to another page, uh, if you mean by implementing those link shorteners, then then yeah, I I can't really think of any any downsides to that practice um, unless you were you know, using it to replace your domain name itself, in which case, you know, um, that that probably would be counterproductive. But if it's if it's for convenience of, of landing pages and more extensive URLs, then sure. All right. Second question uh, that Brittany had is in regards to sizing graphics for social media. Um, she says it seems to be changing all the time. And do we have any resources or recommendations? Uh, for current configurations um, so she can kind of stay up to date uh, on where she could get those from. Yes, I know that we do have um, sort of reference reference sheets or reference pages mm -hmm. that we use to find, you know, the right size for a 
post for LinkedIn, the paid post in the different spots, uh, and for Facebook. Um, I'm going to see if I can find in my notes here what that would be because I don't have it in front of me right okay. now. Uh, there are a lot of res uh, probably fairly up to date resources, you know, on on Google. But um, just to to help, I, I I will find what we use. Um, just as a quick reminder, again, we continue to get people kind of jumping in and out of the chat rooms because I know this is kind of overlapping some other um, sessions. But if you are new into the chat today, um, welcome. Again, welcome to Tech Edge and to the marketing chat room. Uh, my name is Dustin Slapley, and then we have uh, Daniel Schwint, um, who's actually one of our remote workers that works in McPherson for us, um, who is kind of an expert in websites and digital advertising. Um, so kind of the format today is we don't have anything... Uh, I have a few pre-canned questions that I had for Daniel, uh, but we really want this to be an opportunity for you guys to ask us questions. Um, again, as in Daniel is searching for an answer right now for somebody, we may not have the immediate answer or exact answer for you, but uh, we can try to get it to you and at least give you kind of our uh, opinion uh, on, on a few things. Uh, one of the questions that had just come up here also uh, was about scheduling Facebook updates. Um, and here a few minutes ago, I was replying to a comment uh, that here at Next Tech, uh, we actually use a service called HubSpot, um, which I'm going to say is kind of a social media uh, website. It's a CRM tool that has a lot. It's a very powerful tool that we use for a lot of different um, email campaigns and a lot of different things. But we have actually just transitioned um, to actually using um, that system to actually schedule um, some of our Facebook posts, especially um, across platforms. Um, so we can schedule one unique message um, in different platforms uh, at one specific time. And I don't know, Daniel, do you have any other feedback or recommendations of things that you have maybe worked with clients on, on scheduling posts? We, we do schedule out a lot of posts. Um, you know, sometimes you don't want to schedule out too far just because um, if you try to, you know, if you try to come up with a list of posts for six months, um, you're almost guaranteed to somewhat lose lose relevance uh, unless all of your posts are really generic. So, so that's the you know the kind of the trade off with a scheduler is that uh, they're good for helping you stay in front of people, but um, again, there's there's a there's a temptation to leave it on autopilot a bit too much. Um, there are times that we have found. Um, I see Hootsuite was mentioned. Uh, Boost is another one, um, but there are there are some really good scheduling tools out there. Um, one weakness historically with some of those is that um, they will, as was already mentioned previously, the photo sizes for different spots in Facebook and uh, Twitter and other social media platforms. Uh, sometimes they might make an update, they might change things, and those if you if if it's a platform that allows you to make one post and push it out to all these different platforms sometimes they might miss something and it might look a little bit weird on one or two of the platforms uh something that you know wouldn't have happened uh if you had posted on the on the platform itself or used their built-in scheduler And it looks like Aubrey, who is also on our team, is, is making a couple of recommendations for tools in the chat as well. Thank you, Aubrey. Uh, Ted was just asking a quick question about other presentations going on right now. And yes, that is true. Uh, if you go back to kind of the main web page uh, for TechEdge, um, there was one going on from 845 to 910. There was also one that started uh, 915 that was going to 940 uh, was a couple that were going kind of overlap at that specific time that kind of overlap this session. Those uh, should be wrapping up by now or have wrapped up already. Um, and then there's uh, the keynote that actually starts at 10 this morning. So just kind of a recap uh, of other things that are happening out there uh, today. 
All right. Does anybody else um, have other questions or shout outs that they would like uh, to talk about or anything they'd like to hear about um, that's in the chat room this morning? Um, I think one thing I will do, um, I think some of you have been in uh, the chat since uh, we started, uh, but there are a few new attendees. So I'm going to actually go back um, and I'm actually going to put myself on repeat for just a second. Um, but it's one thing that I that I think is that I think is really cool kind of about marketing as a whole that we tend to talk with clients and, and next tech we find very important for us, but it's uh, surveying your customers and really finding out kind of what your customers actually think and are saying about you and your services. Um, a lot of times, you know, from, from the management level, uh, we have this message we want presented, but to ensure that it's always going down to the frontline team members that are uh, corresponding that same message to our customers, uh, surveying their customers and finding out what they're finding or saying or is actually happening is a great tool. So we've done surveying for years. And one of the cool things that I have seen happen over the last, you know, three months, especially with the pandemic situation that we've all been dealing with is I'm going to say the perception of the customer, I think, has tended to change a little bit um, where they are now. I'm focusing a little bit more on the importance of customer service, not being so price conscious and price driven all the time. Uh, but one of the survey metrics we use in our surveys is to really asking customers what's important when uh, choosing a technology company. And typically price is the top leader in that response. But over this three month period, um, that trend has really transitioned where customer service um, seems to be more important. And I think that typically probably goes for a service provider metric in some aspect. Um, just with what we've been through, um, you know, some providers weren't able to do uh, their business or continue with business. Um, we tried our darndest throughout the whole thing to uh, really be up and running as much as possible. You know, we had to take a, a lot of, you know, precautionary measures and some of our, our retail stores were closed for a period of time. Uh, but we really tried to do as much as possible to um, still service uh, the customers out there. And then the other thing that I thought was really interesting, the other survey tool that we use, we use a net promoter score survey that um, actually is triggered out to all customers who are a new install or customers that we have to send a technician out uh, for some kind of a, a trouble related issue that a customer is having issue with. Uh, those scores have actually went up 6% over the last three months, which I just think is phenomenal. And I think it goes back and reiterates that same um, thing that we're hearing through our other survey tool is that uh, customers have been very receptive um, to us being able to provide service. And I think they're uh, resilient in a sense, but just very happy uh, that overall the service providers and overall are uh, really stepping up and being able to help customers still. So again, if you aren't surveying your customers, um, I think it is something that I would highly recommend. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, it doesn't have to be some of the complex methods that we use um, as far as the net promoter score. You know, simply, uh, sometimes it can be as simple as if you have a technician or, you know, could be in the automotive industry or whatever it could be. If you have a, a technician or a salesperson that's helping a customer, simply giving them a postcard with two or three questions and asking them to fill out while you're on site or sending it back later. There's lots of really simple ways to get that information and gauge uh, customer feedback. All right. Um, Daniel posted a little bit of information out there in reply to a question. Uh, it was about um, social media and like sizing of graphics. So I don't know if you have anything further that you want to talk about that, Daniel, or um, I guess you put the link out there that they can specifically go to that has uh, that information posted. Yeah, and, and that's really the what I've used previously. And you can also go to each platform specifically and look through their documentation and, you know, Google's Facebook or sorry, Facebook's business documentation will show you all the different ad specs. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're looking for something to keep on hand so that you don't have to go out to LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook individually and, and look through their documentation, um, this is, this is kind of a more uh, effective way to go. Very good. Um, I don't think we've talked about this one yet, Daniel, but it was one of the things I had on my list to kind of ask you about, um, especially uh, with customers that we deal with uh, and especially websites that we build. I know we always um, 
uh, turn on their Google Analytics and work uh, with those customers and give them uh, reporting tools so they can kind of see trends and tracking on their websites. I guess, can you uh, give our listeners today just a little bit of your feedback as to what maybe some of the key indicators are, some of the key metrics that, um, you know, maybe even for those that are just starting who have never looked at that, some of the key things to be looking at with uh, the Google Analytics? Yeah, so there are two tools that we spend time in when we're looking at uh, analytics and reporting for websites. The first one is, is the very popular, very well-known Google Analytics. Google Analytics will track user visitor activity on your website. It'll show you how many people came. It'll gather whatever information Google has available about them, demographics, uh, you know, what pages they viewed, in what order, how long they stayed. So all of that on-site data, and when it can, it will show where they came from, acquisitions. So did they come from uh, paid Google campaigns or was it organic search? Uh, which search engine did they come from organically? Um, something to remember is that a lot of the information in Google Analytics, there, there's with, with uh, SSL and HTTPS, um, some of that is, is getting stripped out. And so um, you may, you, you're only going to get a sampling when you look at the acquisitions in Google Analytics. Um, so that's just kind of a, a side note with security that a lot of things are being uh, anonymized. So, uh, but as far as what's important in Google Analytics to look at, I would say um, just for understanding your traffic uh, sessions, um, you know, how many, how many visitors is your site getting? I mean, that's the real baseline. Uh, but uh, the more important things would be um, once you know how many visitors you're getting, how long are they staying, and what is your bounce rate? Bounce rate is a huge one that we talk about a lot uh, when it comes to judging the effectiveness of your pages and how useful is your website. And sometimes bounce is misunderstood. Um, it gives the impression that someone who came to your site and left immediately, um, but that's not necessarily the case. A visitor who comes to your website and leaves without visiting a second page, no matter how long they stayed on that page, is a bounce. So if you wrote a viral blog post that had millions of visits, but people came and spent 15 minutes reading that blog post and then left without visiting another page, you have a hundred percent bounce rate. So, uh, and, and that's not necessarily terrible, but that's just a good thing to keep in mind when you're understanding what bounce rate is. That's also why on a lot of SEO blogs, you see uh, the advice to use internal links, use internal links. And what that would mean is a, a link on one page of your site to a different page on your site. Uh, you want to generally send people off site only when necessary. And so, um, and uh, that's what bounce rate will tell you is how many people are coming and how many, you know, how many pages per session do you have? And um, another another reason bounce rate is so huge is, is Google watches it too. Google looks for, uh, what would be called pogo sticking where someone searches for high speed internet and they get five results and they click the first result and they don't see what they wanted and so they click the back button and they click the second result they may not find what they wanted so they click the back button google is actually watching that google sees that you clicked the first result and then you showed up 10 seconds later and you click the second result and that's the pogo sticking and where that stops which is maybe your website maybe you were ranked fifth and when they clicked your website, uh, they didn't show back up again. And Google will kind of assume that uh, your website offered the appropriate content for that search. And um, that's where you'll get uh, maybe a little bit of uh, SEO boost. So um, time on site is a big one, uh, keeping people there, uh, low bounce rate and um, just overall sessions and uh, sessions per user, you know, and page views, how many pages is each person viewing? Um, and then of course, within Google Analytics, you can also look at um, your 
uh, which pages are getting the most traffic just to do all, all sorts of tables of uh, ranking your pages. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I want to chime in really quick. Uh, this is one of the section, sessions, excuse me, um, that there's also a gift card available for giving away. And I want to thank uh, our sponsor for this gift card, which is actually Lenovo. Um, so I have randomly picked one of our winners or one of our attendees, and the winner is Carla W. So congratulations to Carla and we will get your gift card to you. So again, thank you for everybody attending uh, the chat room out there today. Uh, we do have just a few minutes left, probably roughly about five. Um, so if you do have any more questions, um, if you would just please uh, put them in uh, the chat out there and we'll get it to you. And Carla, if you uh, could either personally message me or in the chat, um, just put your last name out there so we have it documented and we can get uh, that gift card to you. I would appreciate it. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Daniel, do you have any last minute tips or tricks that you would like uh, to share with any of our listeners? Um, it looks like there is a question on there on this interface. How do we get back to the lobby? Um, I have been hitting the back button is how I've been using it. I don't know if that's the proper way to do it, but that's how I did it. <laughs> and actually, I believe that's how I got back there myself as well. There may be a more streamlined way of getting there with the interface, but. I'm not going to hit it right now because I'm afraid of losing everybody. <laughs> it looks like Aubrey, Aubrey. Is, Aubrey is to the rescue. She says three dots above then exit webinar. Thank you, Aubrey. Um, one of the last things that, uh, and I talked about this early on in the session, but I'm just going to do a quick recap in case um, there were maybe people that came on let, later. And if you've been following the chat, uh, there does seem to be a lot of conversation, kind of about direct mail in general. Um, and again, I think, you know, probably three to four, even five years ago, um, there seemed to be this uh, trend really in marketing and advertising that print as a whole uh, was going out the door that, you know, we were never going to use it again. And I think we have, there's some specific areas, specifically newspaper. I know we're seeing a downward trend in that specifically, um, other forms of print as well too. But um, historically, um, throughout this whole time, we tend to work with clients and even here at Next Tech, uh, direct mail does uh, work for us. Uh, I, I gave an example of a small targeted direct mail piece that we did um, for a cloud phone campaign here a few weeks ago. And, you know, just within a short week, uh, there were two sales that had come from that. So it continually does prove to be successful for us. Uh, I guess two theories kind of that are coming from, from my perspective is, you know, I think there was all this chatter and hoop, the direct mail piece or the print was going away. So I think overall we are seeing a lot less direct mail pieces overall and just things coming into your mailbox. Um, I've even uh, read some stats that even like the younger um, demographics now um, who have historically uh, never been exposed to much direct mail piece really thinks it's cool now to get a direct mail piece because that's really something that they've never really experienced much in their life. So I think there is, um, I'm not saying it's coming back to its full heyday, but I still, I still think there is a spot for it. Um, and historically we uh, spend, you know, probably about 20 to 22% uh, when we do a campaign, um, overall is spent on direct mail piece as a whole. And Megan and I think some others have chimed in on the conversation today. You know, it's not just about one specific message or, or not message, but the same message, but doing uh, multiple media when you're um, sending out a campaign. Um, you know, we do a mix of radio, TV, digital, uh, direct mail piece. We still even do a little bit of newspaper from time to time because um, there are that specific set of demographics, especially here in rural Northwest Kansas, where Next Tech serves a lot of our customers for as far as phone, internet, and TV on that side of the house. 
um, there is a certain demographic that still reads the newspaper. So um, it's all about coming up with that good mix uh, and really sticking to it and having a good consistent message um, out there.